one of those things I can remember my, my dad used to always tell me adversity builds character. Well, I think uh, everybody's had enough adversity for the last five and a half months. Uh, We're but, pretty good on character for a yeah, while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no, no doubt about that. But, uh, yeah, a lot of things, a lot of moving parts still – uh, you know, about when we're going to play, you know, what, what the protocols are going to be, things like that. Obviously, everything's gotten put on pause by the Mountain West Conference uh, for the fall. But uh, I can tell you we're working diligently uh, to try to get basketball underway. Uh, if not right on time, shortly thereafter, uh, scheduled to start out uh, first day of competition on November the 10th. And then... Uh, I was on a three and a half hour call yesterday trying to to figure out what uh, late winter and early spring football would look like in Logan. You know, if we're uh, if we're playing on uh, February 13th, it may not be a balmy 60 degrees, no. but uh, <laughs> uh, we, we're going to try to see if we can make it work. You know, and that's the thing. It's 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 one of those worlds where sometimes you just have to adjust and and try to make do. And, you know, if we go back in time a little bit, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, you know, where we all remember where we were when uh, Rudy Gobert tested positive and the world kind of got turned upside down. Uh, all of a sudden, conference tournaments started getting shut down and then the NCAA tournament gets canceled and it just was a domino effect. Uh, did you have any idea uh, when you're eating dinner, I think down in Salt Lake with Jerry Bovey, that, uh, that, that the world would essentially get halted the way that it was? Yeah, it was uh, Thursday, March the 12th, and we were actually in the middle of our search uh, for a women's basketball coach uh, before we uh, uh, made the pick of Kayla Ard being our head coach. In fact, that Thursday during the day, she had interviewed with us in the Marriott down in Salt Lake City. We had a couple of other candidates in that day, and then we had one candidate coming in that Friday morning, and then I was supposed to fly to Kansas City where the Big 12 men's and women's tournaments were going on to interview a couple of more candidates. And we were sitting there that Thursday night eating dinner uh, at a restaurant in Salt Lake City and watching the TV and the news flashes across about Rudy uh, contracting, you know, contacting uh, COVID and uh, the rest is kind of history from there. And as you talked about, you know, the, the unwinding of the NCAA men's basketball tournament and uh, all the excitement and anticipation that was uh, with our team coming off beating you know, number four, San Diego State, to win our second consecutive Mountain West tournament. And the, the plug was kind of pulled there. And, uh, you know, we've been adjusting on, a, on the fly for the last five and a half months since then. Yeah. Well, and it's, it, it, you know what, you, you bring up the women's basketball coach. We got a lot of stuff to talk about today. And by the way, if you have questions for, uh, uh, for John Harwell, we'll get to a Q&A coming up here a little bit later on. But what was it like hiring a coach in the middle of a pandemic? Well, it, it was a different experience because, like I said, it, it was a hybrid. Just like uh, our Utah State students right now are taking hybrid classes, some of them in person, some online. Uh, our search was kind of a hybrid, too, because we did some of the interviews in person. We did some Zoom interviews. And then when we got down to our three finalists, they all made the decision, you know, to come to campus. We said, hey, you can do it either way. They all three uh, decided to still travel when we were still early in this. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd be remiss, and, and I know we may talk about this a little bit later, but uh, Kayla Ard, you're talking about some uh, some energy and excitement coming into our women's basketball program. She's hit the ground running. You, uh, I think you described her as the women basketball coach version of Craig Smith. Well, I did, but my wife's sitting back here behind us, and, and you know, she goes, you can't, you can't say that about her. I said, that's a compliment. If you call somebody the, the women's version of uh, Craig Smith, I, I think that's a pretty high compliment. I, I, I do, too. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, as you kind of transitioned uh, through the spring and into the summer, you know, there for a moment in May and June, it seemed like COVID was starting to retreat a little bit, and it kind of felt like there was a lot of heavy optimism that this wouldn't affect football. Uh, then in July, the numbers really start to pick up, and then it gets really out of control again. And at that point, when did you really feel like the football season was really in jeopardy? Yeah, you know, mid-May, as you said, the numbers weren't that high, especially here in Utah. And, and you, you thought we were uh, getting to the other side of this at that point. And, you know, those of us who work in the collegiate athletics world, in any athletic world, uh, Part of, part of your mindset is to be trained to be an eternal optimist or yeah. a, a glass yeah. half full person. 
So, you know, mid-May, we said, hey, yeah, you know, we've got another couple of months to work through this thing. We're going to be just fine as it uh, rolls into football season. But as we got into the later part of June and early July and the numbers started to spike in certain areas uh, and, and some concerns, you know, some side effect concerns, that was when we started saying, hey, this, you know, this unfortunately may have an impact on, on football season. And then, you know, fast forward into late July and early August and, and obviously uh, some things unfolded that just, just didn't make it possible. How difficult was, I mean, so the uh, the Big Ten decides they're not going to play. The Pac-12 followed, suits, uh, followed suit. And then uh, I believe later the day, the Mountain West Conference uh, makes your announcement as well. Uh, was that, I got to imagine that was probably in the works for a while, though, at least a couple of days. When did, when did you feel like, okay, this is the decision we're going to go? Yeah, I, you know, and a lot of people ask this question, say, and they ask the same question of the Mountain West that they ask of the Big Ten. Well, why in the heck did you decide, you know, three, four, five days a week out to announce a pushback of the schedule only to a few days later say, hey, we're pulling the plug on it? And, and there was a lot of dialogue back and forth. The ultimate decision, you know, didn't really come until that Monday. And, and at the end of the day, um, a, as with every, uh, you know, major decision in our league, no different than the other leagues, it, it's ultimately the presidents and the chancellors yeah. uh, who, who hold the votes. Obviously, you know, and, and we have a great working relationship uh, with the presidents in our league. And, you know, I'm, I'm so fortunate uh, President Cockett, she's a rock star and, you know, she's been tremendous. And what a lot of people don't understand is, is the dynamics. If, you know, I've, I've used this example several times, potentially if it was Utah State, and Wyoming and Boise State and uh, Colorado State, given the, the number of infections and things like that and, and that geographic footprint, we may could have played, but we're but three or four institutions in a 12 institution league. And when you've got three institutions in the state of California who basically said, hey, we're not even letting people back on campus. And also New Mexico, where the governor comes out and says, hey, there's, there's not any sporting events being played. Then obviously that plays into the bigger decision. So um, it was trending that way, uh, you know, about a five or six days out and I could see that coming but again until the final vote uh, was done that Monday uh, but we did have enough advance notice you know to try to try to make sure our student athletes were informed before it got out on social media but yeah. in today's world of social media as soon as something is out you know it spreads like wildfire how uh, what were those conversations like with your student athletes you know, they, they were, it was frustration, it was being mad, it was being sad, all those emotions in one. But I'll say this, you know, if, if there was any kind of silver lining in it, at least some finality. Because those kids for, you know, basically for two months from mid-June until mid-August, it was a range of emotions. It was a roller coaster. Hey, this day things are trending pretty well. Looks like we may be able to play. Next day, some stats come out don't look so good, maybe fast forward two or three days and we had 8, 10, 12, 15 kids who had to sit out of practice uh, because of either uh, positive infections or contact tracing. So it was a roller coaster of emotions, which at least on that Monday, you know, there was some finality to it, it at least for the next, you know, two, three months anyway. Take our first break, come back, and uh, we'll talk more with the athletic director at Utah State, John Hartwell. It's the Aggie Coaches Show. Hey, we don't need football games to have a coaches show. But we'll talk more about uh, what's going on currently, uh, what the future could look like in the next several months. Uh, we'll also take your questions as well. You're listening to the Aggie Coaches Show. John Hartwell, athletic director, sitting in right here on the Aggie Sports Network from Learfield IMG College.
You're listening to the Aggie Coaches Show here on the Aggie Sports Network from Learfield IMG College. Trust me, nobody would want uh, to see a football game uh, this weekend more than I would, but uh, we might have to wait a little bit. Uh, one thing that you mentioned in our previous segment, and uh, we, we've done several of the podcasts. By the way, you can uh, search Aggies all the way on whatever podcast platform you'd like, uh, and we get you great conversations with coaches and administrators as well. But but you did. I asked you um, if the um, if, if football in the spring is it just rhetoric or is there actual some substance to it? And you told me like, look, a lot of things need to go our way for it to work, and there's a lot of work that's got to go into it, but there's substance to it. Yeah, like I said, we had oh, we'll get your mic going here. There we go. Yeah, we we had about a three and a half hour meeting yesterday amongst all the Mountain West athletic directors. Had a couple of football student athletes on that meeting. And, and we're putting together a plan to play uh, late winter and, and into the spring. And, you know, looking at uh, games from, from mid-February through mid-April, it wouldn't be a full 12-game schedule, but playing probably all eight conference opponents and looking at uh, the probability of having a conference championship game uh, April 17th. So... You know, there, there's a lot of factors that go into trying to play in the spring, not the least of which is the weather. But one of the big things that, that I think everybody is consistent on is however we do it, if we do a spring season, not to have it bleed over and have an adverse effect on next season. We, we all uh, hope that uh, this time next year we're, we're getting ready to, to tee it up for a full 12-game regular season schedule of Aggie yeah. football. And and I and I apologize. I should know if this became official or not. Uh, last time you and I talked on the podcast, word was getting out that the NCAA is going to grant another year of eligibility for seniors. Uh, and, and again, or at least allowing universities to make that decision. Uh, is that official? Is that something that, that is going to be put in place? Yeah, it, it is official. So so the NCAA has has granted that waiver. And in essence, what it does is says, hey, all of your uh, student athletes can get a redo, if yeah. you will, uh, of their senior year. And that's very consistent with what they did last spring with all of our spring sports who who got the uh, proverbial plug pulled on them in the middle of the season. You know, we're working through that. You, it, it creates two significant challenges, uh, and, and they're both about equal. One from a, an expense standpoint. So if you have another, you know, let's just say you have 50 – student athletes who are seniors uh, who who may want to return to play. If you say an average scholarship is $30,000, that's a million five right there from a financial standpoint. But probably even more important um, is roster management. And, and let's just take the sport of football. So I, I think right now we have roughly 108 uh, young men on our on our football roster. So all of a sudden, if you say, okay, we're going to grant everybody that's a senior another year, and oh, by the way, you're not telling those high school seniors who you signed that, no, you can't come. So they come too. So let's say you have 135 uh, student athletes on your football roster. The one thing they're not doing is they're not changing that you can only have 11 players on the field at any one time. That, that's not getting increased to 15. So you just think about the number of football student athletes that are in the transfer portal every year based on a squad size of about 100. If you put that at 135, oh that will increase exponentially. So you've got a roster management and a financial concern that you have to look at. So we'll, we'll continue uh, working through those things. And that just applies to seniors, too. It's not like everybody's getting an extra Well, year. no, everybody oh, actually does. would. Okay. And, and that's the same thing they did in the spring. So technically speaking, if, if you're a freshman, you would get another freshman year. But the way we handled that in the spring is we said, hey, we, we want to keep rosters the same size. So if you can work a couple of those in within your uh, – squad size and your scholarship limit, so be it. And we also said, hey, for all you underclassmen, we don't even want to, you to worry about this. When you get to be a senior, if you decide you may want to come another year, gotcha. we'll, we'll visit about it then. So Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, by the way, we are streaming live on Facebook and on the uh, Utah State Athletic website. 
if you've got a question uh, that you'd like to answer or you'd like an answer from from uh, John Hartwell, leave us a question on there and uh, we'll take a look at those and uh, get to those on our next segment. So feel free to type in a question. We'd love to answer as many of those as we can coming up in our next segment. Uh, you talk about the financial ramifications, and I think a lot of people are interested uh, in that because uh, obviously these are big numbers when it comes to college football. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, and you don't need to go into heavy specifics on this, but let's just say the spring football doesn't happen. Uh, how much, how devastating is that to the Utah State Athletics? Yeah, so so we've run these numbers and, uh, again, uh, have run several scenarios over the course of the last two or three months. If we did not have football at all, so uh, no football fall or spring, um, it would be about a $10 million revenue hit to us, uh, and that's made up of several things. Uh, the Mountain West television package, a little over $3 million. You've got, uh, you know, it would be a negative impact to our good friends at uh, Learfield IMG College who provide our corporate sponsorships and obviously our radio broadcast because if you don't have events, then, yeah. you know, the signage in the stadium obviously uh, is not as worth as much. You would also have um, ticket sales, which is probably the most obvious, and the donations that go along with those. So you've got a whole host of things there. So it would be about $10 million on the revenue side. But on the flip side, if, you know, not having any fall sports and if we shut those down uh, totally, including football, we save uh, about six and a half million. So it's about a three and a half million dollar hit, which is a bunch of money. But relatively speaking to, to some of our uh, counterparts, it's, it's not it's a manageable number, if you will. And, and the other thing I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, you've got some schools in our league who have bright, new, shiny stadiums and facilities, but they've also got massive annual debt service that they have to pay. Uh, for instance, Colorado State, I think their annual debt service is about $11 million a year. Ours is a little over a million dollars a year. So that's $10 million basically that we save there that we don't have to pay that they're paying. Yeah, they have a beautiful stadium, uh, but they've got themselves in a financial bind right now because of that. So uh, uh, again, uh, that three and a half million dollar number uh, assumes we play basketball and, and obviously our uh, we've got those same corresponding revenue numbers with that. I think one of the interesting things a lot of people don't realize, you know, our new, uh, our new Mountain West television package, which is with CBS Sports and Fox Sports. And this would have been the first year. Yeah, that, this right? would have been the first year. So it, it takes our revenue number for television from about 1.1 million a year to about 3.2 million a year. But I don't, I think what a lot of people don't realize of that number, 85% of the value in that is basketball, or excuse me, is football. Only 15% of that value wow. is, is basketball. And, you know, you think about basketball in the Mountain West, which is obviously really good, but from a national perspective and what drives the dollars, it's that football that drives the train. And so that's why it's so important. Um, and we have had conversations with our broadcast partners that if we play a spring season, hopefully we can fulfill our television obligations and still get those dollars. Uh, that would be uh, obviously really, really important. Uh, let's talk a little bit about basketball. Um, John Rothstein uh, sent out a tweet earlier today that the NCAA uh, Basketball Advisory Committee uh, is looking to recommend a start date of about November 25th. Uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, on that, and uh, what is – I mean, again, I, when I ask these questions, I know there's some things you can say and can't say, uh, but, but what does a schedule look like in that regard? Sure. So our, our scheduled start date for basketball is November 10th. I think UC Irvine is supposed to come here on uh, November 10th to kick off the season. So it, let's say if it does get uh, postponed till the 25th, that's 15 days. Uh, the 25th is actually the day before Thanksgiving. And, and the thought process there is, th is that Utah State University, along with most of the institutions across the country, are sending students home for the Thanksgiving break and not having them come back until spring semester. So the thought process there is that, you know, you would reduce the number of people on campus and, and hopefully have a safer environment. Uh, and I use that term in quotations yeah, yeah. Uh, to play. So what would that do for us? If you look at our current schedule, uh, that would impact uh, one of our ESPN tournament that we're supposed to play in in, in Myrtle Beach. So 
Uh, our staff is already looking at that. Again, that's a suggestion from the Basketball Oversight Committee. It has not been approved, but I, it would not surprise me if the season were backed up a little bit. My biggest contention and the people in our league office and my fellow ADs have probably heard this ad nauseum from me. I do not want us to have a conference only schedule because obviously we have a chance to be really good. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, the non-conference opportunities against high RPI teams, when I say high, low RPI teams, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm with you. One, one through 50, those opportunities help not only Utah State when it comes NCAA tournament selection time, but it helps our entire league. And we need to have those opportunities for us and for the other members of the Mountain West Conference to be able to to help our uh, RPI in basketball. Yeah, I just – I. You're right, and there's so much of what Utah State has done over the last two years. I mean, you were a uh, uh, you were an eight seed um, or a seven seed. I forget two years ago, um, and and then this year you would have been a relatively good seed as well had there been an NCAA tournament. And that's all built upon the work that you did before the conference season. So I, I mean, it's absolutely imperative that you're able to play some of those games. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you think back to the wins over LSU and Florida. Uh, you know, th those kinds of wins when, when that committee gets in the selection room, uh, they really help you out in terms of seating. So, uh, it, you know, and I know a lot of people are probably saying, well, gosh, you don't have Sam Merrill anymore, uh, you know, a likely mid-second round draft pick. Uh, yeah, that's true, but our, uh, our crew, our crew in the Estes Center, our men's basketball staff and team have this quiet confidence about them because if you look from number one on the roster all the way through about 15 or 16, we've got a couple of very talented walk-ons. Yep. The, the talent level is very, very deep, and uh, they're excited. A lot of new faces, uh, a lot of returning guys, obviously, uh, Nimi and Brock and uh, – uh, you know, Bean and that whole crew, but you got a lot of new faces that can flat out play. I've been to see them, you know, out there and three or four you're, you're times. You're a basketball guy too. This is your wheelhouse. Oh yeah, out. yeah. So you, I'm, you can spot talent. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about it, and uh, just hope they get get the opportunity to play sooner than later. Well, one thing too that uh, uh, from my perspective as a play by play guy, I've got to work on my language skills because we went overseas quite a bit and uh, to, for for recruits. And there's some names here I gotta I gotta understand, but boy, these are apparently really talented. Well, kids. let me give you a tip. Probably what you want to start on before you even start the language thing is you better make sure that uh, that our media relations folks, that Kyle Cottom has a great pronunciation guide, because because there's a few of those names yeah. you're gonna have to buy a vowel for. I, I so there, there's some work to be done there for sure, uh, but but that's the thing. Like I, I love what. Obviously, Craig Smith has built such a wonderful program, and that's why, I mean, we've had a few people come in here today during breaks and before the show, and like, hey, are we having basketball? Like, I know I know we lost football, but we got to have basketball, and uh, and it's good to hear that we're on that path. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a consensus. Again, there may be a slight delay in it, but uh, not only do I believe that we're going to have basketball, but I also believe we're going to have basketball with fans, which obviously is a, is a huge uh, advantage for us with, with yeah. the herd and the, the home court advantage of the spectrum uh and and i'm sure you've got other teams like san diego state unlv new mexico they want to play those out of conference games too because you know they're they're able to schedule some tough games yeah they do and and obviously uh san diego state ha had a great year last year you know boise's got a couple of high level transfers sitting out uh new mexico a as well and then unlv uh, ha has a couple of transfers as well. So I think our league is going to be even better uh, in the upcoming year than it was last year. And hopefully we can – I mean, it helps us all if we can get back to be a three- or four-bid league oh, yeah. in men's basketball. Yeah, I, think the, I think the conference is well on its way to getting there for sure. All right, coming up next, it's your chance to ask questions. Uh, I'll quit running my mouth, and you can ask uh, questions for John Hartwell, what your thoughts – and uh, your opinions are and uh, what the future looks like for Utah State as well. And again, if you're watching on Facebook or on the Utah State website as well, uh, you can submit your questions there and we'll, we'll get to yours as uh, much as we can. You're listening to the Aggie Coaches Show with John Hartwell, Athletic Director at Utah State on the Aggie Sports Network from Learfield IMG College.
Welcome on back. It's the Aggie Coaches Show. We're live here at Old Chicago. Big thanks to Old Chicago for letting us hang out here again uh, for the uh, football and basketball seasons. Uh, always love coming down here. Best deep dish pizza you'll ever find. Uh, and uh, the place is hopping tonight. And so appreciate everybody coming down here and, uh, and hanging out with us uh, during uh, – a Tuesday evening. I remember a jazz game. Uh, just uh, we're a few minutes away from you. Got plenty of time. Don't don't worry. We'll get to the jazz game here soon enough. Uh, by the way, game seven. You're going jazz, right? Yeah, jazz all the way. Nice. I like it. I like it. All right. Your chance to ask questions. If you got one, uh, raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you. If you got a question for uh, John Hartwell, and uh, let your voice be heard. If you've got uh, thoughts or questions about the athletic department, uh, feel free to uh, pipe in. Or if you're watching on the Facebook page. Uh, you can also uh, text in uh, your questions, and we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, by the way, we've got a couple of questions rolling in already on the Facebook page. Uh, you're, and again, I know you can't play favorites here, but uh, uh, the question, first question rolling in, uh, who are some of these impressive new Aggies, and, and what do you like about them? And I won't ask you to pronounce names yet. Yeah, yeah, I, I won't even try it. Well, I think last year uh, we were the tallest team in the country or maybe the second tallest team in the yeah. country, and, and we've uh, added to that even more. Let me talk about – I want to talk about a couple of the guys who people may recognize the names, but they, they obviously didn't see play last year. Uh, Marco Anthony yes. is a beast. Now, uh, a lot of people saw Marco sitting at the end of the bench last year. He was He's a transfer, has a national championship ring from the University of Virginia from two years ago. Um, he was always easy to spot on the bench. Not only was he in street clothes, but that dude had a different pair of shoes, yes. uh, of, of Nike shoes on every game. But Marco is about a 6'5", 230-pound guy. I'll never forget uh, last fall, about this time, Coach Anderson walked through the spectrum, and he, uh, he did a double take when he saw Marco. He said, that looks like a linebacker to me, and, and he plays like a linebacker. Obviously, he is not uh, maybe the shooter that Sam is, but there are very few of that, those elite-level shooters. But what Marco is, is he is a 6'5 bruiser, and he will take the ball to the rack with authority. I, uh, I had him on this show at the end of the season last year on the coach's show, and I asked him, what's his, what's his goal? what are his goals for next season? And he goes, I want to be the uh, Mountain West Defensive Player of the Year. And uh, you love a guy that comes in and goes, what do you want to do? And he goes, I want to I be the best defender in the league. That's the kind of attitude you love to hear from a kid. Yeah, and I used this analogy the other day, and I say this lovingly about Sam Merrill because obviously Sam Merrill's don't come along very no. often. But I, th I would say one thing about Marco's game that's going to be inverse to Sam's game, as many times as Sam Merrill fell down on the ground taking the ball to the hoop, I think Marco is going to knock that many people down going to the hoop. So I, I'm excited about seeing that. And, and you know, the other newcomers, and, and that's uh, another thing, obviously with the, the COVID-19 effects and, and the challenges with international travel, uh, I'll have to give a, a shout-out to Neil Abercrombie, our VP of Governmental Affairs, and his relationships in Washington, D.C., because he has been a rock star helping us uh, get some of these guys back, including the last uh, member of our team uh, that got back, uh, Z. I will call him Z yeah. because, again, in pronunciation, uh, it's it's a long name, but came from Russia. Uh, he was a late signee. He signed in June. What a lot of people don't understand about or know about Z, he scored 34 points last summer uh, against the elite level U.S. college team. So he, he can flat out play. But he actually had to go from Moscow to the Ukraine, and he had a Ukraine visa to get to the U.S. So uh, uh, these guys took quite a trip to get here, but we've got everybody here on the men's basketball team now. They are quarantining. Uh, you know, we, we may get a couple of questions about that. We have been testing student athletes uh, all the way back to, to the beginning of June when our football student athletes came back. Uh, we have had some positives. I, I don't mind, mind saying this because we put it out to the media. We've had about 40 positive tests uh, out of uh, 700 total tests. Uh, and, and we've done, Mike Williams and his staff, our ath athletic training staff, ha have done a great job in terms of contact tracing and isolating and, and doing all the things necessary uh, to keep us from having, you know, a huge explosion in the number of positive tests. 
Well, and it's, it's one thing, too, that I know you guys take very seriously, and knowing Mike Williams the way we do, I mean, that's a guy that's not going to leave any stone unturned in making sure that these athletes are watched over and protected as much as possible. But uh, now that they're back on campus, is that something that will continue to happen, uh, regular testing with the athletes? Yeah, what we'll do is is do as long as we're not in competition, uh, our high risk sports, which uh, those those were defined by Dr. Brian Hainline, who is the NCAA chief medical officer, which uh, ironically enough, uh, most of our fall sports other than cross country are high risk. And that includes volleyball, um, soccer and, and football and then both men's and women's basketball are defined that way as well even volleyball so, huh? yes wow. yes um so we will be testing all of those teams uh every other week um while we're not in competition while they're just training and and working out and uh again if if we have a positive test we'll do contact tracing isolation all of that good stuff that that unfortunately has kind of become routine now yeah. for our our sports medicine staff another question rolling in uh there was some news a couple of weeks ago about some uh some testing that seems like it could be done in 15 minutes or so or or a number of hours uh cheaply and could be done is that kind of technology starting to filter down to you guys as well uh, do you anticipate being uh, being able to be assisted by that yeah we hope so we hope the saliva testing as yeah. opposed to the uh, what I would deem as a pretty invasive nose swab. Have you had it yet? Uh, at one time, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Was it as bad as everybody says it is? Uh, it, it's pretty invasive. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, that the testing there and, and probably what makes that even more difficult is the turnaround time on those. So when, when you go, you know, two, three days, uh, you know, and even further out than 72 hours and don't have your results, that that's challenging uh, when you have to uh, – isolate those individuals. And, and if you look at the leagues that uh, as of right now are playing football, uh, a lot of those leagues are going to test three times a week. But if you can get that rapid testing done, then obviously that, that makes the turnaround time much quicker. And that's kind of why I, I think, and I talked to some people across the country and, and they said, you know, back in March, April, they kind of felt like we would have that by now. And that's why they felt pretty comfortable that we'd have a football season. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, that just never came into place. No, it hasn't. And, and you know, there's, there's two components. You've got the rapid testing, uh, which would at least identify positives, uh, and, and then the vaccine. You know, yeah. and, the, and the vaccine, while they've made some progress, you know, it's probably going to be, uh, you know, at least into the spring before those come available. And no different than the rapid testing. Once they find uh, an effective test, those are obviously going to be in high demand. So the, yeah. the ability for us to get those is, is going to be key towards uh, us getting back to, I won't even call it normal. I'll call it our new normal. New normal. What are, what's a, uh, and by the way, anybody have questions, I don't mean to be cutting anybody off. Feel free to raise your hand and Ajay will get to you. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, but what's a day in the life of a fall athlete like right now? I mean, obviously there's school and academics, but, but, but uh, for a football player or a volleyball player, uh, how are they going about their, their daily life? Yeah, so obviously class started back yesterday. And, and again, for some of our student athletes, uh, there, there are some classes that are uh, in person that obviously you have the social distancing. There's a, a mask requirement on campus, um, you know, proper hygiene. So, so that's important. But a lot of our student athletes, even though they're here in town, all of their classes are online. So uh, they have that. Our uh, academic support staff, just as they were doing in the spring and summer, uh, will continue to monitor and, and uh, make sure that our student athletes are doing what they need to in the classroom. Here, here's one thing that I really am proud of, because despite all of the adversity in the spring um, with, with sports being pulled from our student athletes uh, across the board, the highest semester GPA since we've been recording it at Utah State. So so hats off to our student athletes for facing that adversity, to our uh, academic support staff for, for the uh, yeoman's work they did, and, and ultimately to our coaching staffs too, because not, not being able to be in competition, not being able to, to practice during that time, literally coaches were in daily contact with our student athletes, making sure they were taking care of business in the classroom. And speaking of the classroom now, I'm sure that uh, the football players, I don't want to say take things a little bit lighter, but 
probably adjust their class load a little bit differently in the fall than the spring. Uh, I got to imagine Gary Anderson say, no, get your credits in now because we may be playing in the spring. Yeah, it, it would look a little bit different, and, and you're right about that. Um, I, I was going to finish up on the previous question you asked. So they're, they are back to lifting weights and doing some conditioning now. Actually, in football, uh, the, the rules have been modified some uh, for, for those leagues that are not currently playing or, or getting ready for games. Uh, so they're allowed to do, you know, uh, several hours a week uh, of walkthroughs and things like that. Uh, but mostly it's it's conditioning and, you know, weightlifting right now, trying to uh, it, and again, if this plays out in, in the late winter and early spring, like we hope it does uh, right now will be more instructional than anything, almost yeah. like our, our spring practice normally is. Hmm. Uh, John Hartwell, he's the athletic director at Utah State, joining us right here on the Aggie Sports Network from Learfield IMG College is Utah State getting set for uh, a fall season unlike any other. And is, is it kind of sunk in yet? I mean, how this we should be talking about Washington State right now. How is it? Is it is it kind of settled in as to what's going on here? You know, I, I there's a part of you that that's you're hoping you're in a bad dream yeah, and you yeah. just wake up and it's not reality. I, I tell you where it kind of settled in a little bit the other night, and, and not that this was necessarily a blockbuster matchup, but watching some of Austin P yeah. in Central Arkansas the other night, I'm like, man, you know, it, it's – and talking to some of our student athletes, it was it was the same way. They, you know, uh, until you see it actually going on and the fact, hey, they're playing right now and we're not playing, that's, that's – uh, it's a tough pill to swallow in some ways. Yeah, no doubt. All right, we'll take our final break and uh, wrap this show up next. You're listening to the uh, Aggie Coaches Show featuring Athletic Director John Hartwell right here on the Aggie Sports Network from Learfield IMG College.
Here on the Aggie Sports Network from Learfield IMG College. Uh, big thanks to everyone who's been hanging out with us. And by the way, big thanks to Old Chicago. Love coming down here. And by the way, they just, uh, Thad and his crew just kill it down here. Yeah, great food, great service. And as you mentioned, Thad Willis, the GM, and, and his entire family, I think they've got four generations of, of Aggies uh, uh, who made it over the mountains from Lake Town, and uh, they, they are tremendous Aggies, and we appreciate all they do uh, as corporate sponsors and donors and ticket holders for us. Yeah, and just – and, in, and by the way, best pizza in town. They do a great job. I think, what was it? The best uh, best uh, wings in town, best pizza in town. And then uh, I think uh, if people had a pull about burgers, they'd probably win that thing too. See, it's a little hard for me to get my southern influence out of me, so I go the Memphis dry rubs are my go-to. So. Nice. And there you go. <laughs> you take the boy out of the south. You can't take the south out of the boy. All right. Uh, we had a couple more questions rolling. I want to get to these real quick. Uh, obviously, you had two Pac-12 opponents on the schedule, Washington State, and they were going to be here at uh, Maverick Stadium. Uh, is there going to be any ability to try to get them back on the schedule in the near future here in Logan? Yeah, so we're working with them right now. Pat Chun, the athletic director at Washington State, has been a longtime friend. We're working on, uh, you know, and we're scheduled to open up there next year. Probably what we'll end up doing is going to play that game and then rescheduling a home and home. Probably next year's game will turn into somewhat of a guarantee game okay. for us. So they'll pay us some more money uh, and then we'll schedule. Uh, we're, we're already looking at calendars out there. Um, Jerry Bovey's uh, working on that on some football scheduling stuff to try to reschedule a home and home for them. Uh, as far as the Washington game, you know, that, that was just a one-time, uh, a guarantee game. And while it's a, it's a good trip for us to go to, for our fans to go to, because it's not crazy far away. And um, one of the best scenic views of all of college football, too. Oh, oh yeah. The, uh, the Puget Sound there. I, I, yeah. equ I equate that place to the, uh, to the Pacific Northwest version of Knoxville, Tennessee, and the Vol Army. It's, uh, it's pretty cool cool atmosphere so we will uh try to try to get them back on the schedule sometime out there as well but it's probably you know it's so difficult in scheduling when you know games are scheduled seven eight nine years in advance to try to you know shoehorn games back in yeah it is it'll it'll be interesting to see the fallout from games that that are lost this year and then the last minute scheduling of these you know i i applaud the effort uh, of those schools trying to play uh, but as I've, I've talked to some friends of mine in, in the Big 12 and in the SEC, uh, they, they are staying the course right now. But I think all of them are, are a little hesitant to saying, hey, yeah, we're going to get all our games in. It'll be interesting to see how, how as teams start to play here over the next two or three weeks, how that all plays out. You know, and, and uh, I mean, you know, reading headlines today, it's, you know, Big Ten and, you know, it, it's just – Every day is, and, and I'm not asking a comment on that. I'm just every day there's some new story or wrinkle to, to what's going on out there. It's it just every day is a little different. Yeah, it really is. And, and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this too. Our coaches across the board, I mean, I know we've talked a lot about football and men's basketball, but our coaches across the board in all 16 sports, uh, both coaches and our student athletes have been so resilient through all of this. Uh, it's been an emotional roller coaster uh, through the whole thing, and, and we're not totally done with it yet, but they've stayed so positive and so focused, and, and I couldn't ask for a better group uh, of coaches, student athletes, and administrators to work with. You know, at the end of the day, though, it is about those student athletes, and I know that uh, you're concerned about their well-being and not only staying healthy, but, but also their mental health, too. I mean, this is, this is tough. You prepare for these moments, and when they get taken away, it's very difficult, and so I got to imagine hearing that they're for the most part, I'm sure, in a, in a pretty good place. That, that's good news to hear. Yeah, and, and we've made a concentrated effort to make sure that we have resources available to them from a mental health perspective, and, and, and we talk about it. I mean, even amongst our coaches and staff, you know, <laughs> I tell them, uh, you know, if, if this hasn't been a grind on you mentally, you're lying to yourself. And, yeah. uh, I, I again, I get that as, as I've got my co-pilot back here who has the Ph.D. in counselor education, you know, Heather, make sure, hey, uh, make sure that you're taking care of uh, mental health. So that's, that's vitally important. Uh, do you anticipate things kind of calming down a little bit? Because you mentioned when you made the decision not to play football, it was almost like a relief. Like, okay, finally, we've made a decision. This is what we're going to do. Have you gotten that sense that now that that decision's been made, you can just kind of focus in on, okay, let's take care of our fall, fall athletes, make sure they're okay, and now let's see what we can do to make sure winter sports can play. 
in a way, but I think we're we're constantly planning toward you know and and planning, but while also still fielding curveballs too. Yeah. And, and as we had this call about football yesterday, the sooner we can come up with a clear picture to do this and say, hey, here's going to be our start date, here's going to be our end date, here are who our eight opponents are, and can get that on the table. Um, I, I think the better off everybody's going to be because the the indecision and uncertainty uh, creates anxiety for everybody. I think that's uh, where a lot of us are right now. There's no doubt about it. John, we appreciate it, man. Thanks for doing this. Absolute, this. Scotty. Thank there, you. The athletic director at Utah State, John Hartwell, kind enough to join us here on the Aggie Sports Network from Learfield IMG College. So with no football games, uh, we get a chance to talk. Uh, I mean, Gary Anderson is going to be part of the show. We'll talk to some student athletes. Uh, I think we'll have a chance to talk to the new women's basketball coaching staff. Also, uh, Craig Smith will join us as well. Uh, I'm sure throughout this process, as we get you ready for uh, get you ready for whatever might be here in the next uh, few months as well. Big thanks to everyone who helped us out here at Old Chicago. You've been listening to the Aggie Coaches Show on the Aggie Sports Network from Learfield IMG College.